Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Welcome to this uh, Palestine Solidarity ca- Campaign webinar. This one is particularly focused around women and what they are doing to oppose the occupation in Palestine, but also looking at what women here in the UK have been doing as trade unionists and as activists here. So thank you all of you for coming to listen. We think this is a really important topic. Um, We're going to start, our first speaker was due to be um, Dana, who is from the Coalition um, of Women for Peace, uh, which is an Israeli-based group of activists who are doing lots of direct action in Israel um, to oppose the occupation. Uh, They particularly do quite a lot of work on the on the Gaza border, actually, uh, particularly light shows. And we've got a short, um, fortunately, Dana had a fall earlier today. She's had, she's fine, uh, but she's had to go for some treatment. Uh, she was hoping she might be able to come, uh, but she hasn't been able to come. So we've sent her lots of love and solidarity for a quick recovery from her fall. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Lee James. She's the Equalities Advisor at ASLEF. Um, so last year, the... Uh, Women's TUC had a motion at their conference, in fact, not last year, the year before, uh, calling on the TUC to organise a women's delegation. And um, it took a bit of time, but eventually that women's delegation took place. And Lee, uh, along with Zita, who will be speaking later, are two of the women uh, that attended that delegation. It was led by Philippa Harvey, who is now the chair of the uh, Women's Committee. Uh, I think Philippa might be on the call somewhere, so hopefully I'm sure she'll have some questions and thoughts about that um, that delegation. But I know it was an extremely powerful visit for those women, um, and Lee is going to talk to us a little bit about her experiences, and I'm hoping people will have some questions for them uh, going forward. So, Lee, it's lovely to see you. Thank you for giving up your time this evening for us, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Louise. So, um, yeah, as Louise said, I was lucky enough to take part in the um, first uh, all-female UK trade union delegation to Palestine. Um, So we went over in April last year. Now, like a lot of trade unionists, I was aware of the situation in Palestine. I'd been to fringe meetings at TUC Congress, at Women's Conference, stuff like that before. Um, But when we actually got there, when you actually see for reality, it's very different experience. Um, so trade unions were represented from all different sectors in this country. And we, it was a slightly different delegation in that we met with organisations that were predominantly concerned with the welfare of uh, women and children in Palestine. Um, and what I wanted to do was we met with a lot of different people. It was a really packed schedule. So we met with a lot of different people. Um, And we met some really inspirational people. But I just wanted to speak a little bit about two people that probably touched me the most while I was there and had the biggest effect on me. Um, So the first person I wanted to speak about was um, Manal Tamimi, who we met when we went to Nabu Saleh. Now, um, she was really kind. She invited us into our house, a whole delegation. So there was like 13 odd women sitting in her front room. Um, so the first thing you notice is when you when we went into her house, it's just an, an ordinary home, but outside um, they've got their garden and in their garden there are all tear gas canisters, which they have put in with the flowers to try and make something beautiful out of something ugly is what she told us. So we went into her house, sat down in her front room. Um, we got given a cup of tea, all their kids were in the kitchen, there were some of them playing on the computer, it was just, you know, like any of our homes. Um, And we met her husband as well, who's actually a journalist and who um, makes films about what is actually happening in the region as well. And so we actually managed to watch one of his films while we were there. And um, it it was quite a surreal experience because we were just sitting in a home where the kids were like, doing stuff in the kitchen and we were watching this film about what it's like to live in Nabu Saleh under occupation and and it was brutal that you know it showed um just villages being attacked for no reason their houses being tear gassed they're being raided in the middle of the night um skunk water being sprayed at their buildings as well um and and won't I won't lie you actually do see someone being killed on the film and it was an extremely hard watch um 
And I think it really affected a lot of us that were on the delegation. But this is the reality of life for people in Palestine. Um, so we watched we watched the film, and then she went on to explain that in the village, what they do is on a, I think it's on a Friday. Every Friday, they have a silent march through the village, which is to protest occupation. And the thing that really got to me the most is she said that at the beginning of the march on every Friday, they all say goodbye to each other because they don't know that by the time that the march is finished, whether or not somebody will be arrested or injured or even killed. So they they say this kind of quiet goodbye to each other. Um, and I think the thing that you can really take from this is that um, it's dangerous for them to invite people like us into their homes to speak to us about the situation. Um, just the night before we got there, their house had been raided in the middle of the night. Whether or not the soldiers knew that we were coming, I don't know. Um, so when we were there as well, one of her sons was there, but the other son was actually in prison um, and they didn't know where he was or when he was going to be released. Her husband has been to prison. She herself has been shot before. Um, but despite all of these things that happened to them and to the threats to their own personal safety and ultimately to their life, they continue to try and get the message out about what life is like in Palestine under occupation. Um, and they're really humble about it as well. We were all quite upset and um, they were just like kind of accepting that this is life, but we want you to tell our story to the rest of the world to get the word out so that people understand what it's, what it's really like for us to live here. Um, and they didn't want our pity and they didn't want the tears that they were. They just wanted us to be able to share their stories and to campaign for them and to show them solidarity really. Um, so that was, that was one experience. And then, in a quite a contrast really um we met a, a, a young woman she's only 27 called Mona Delam and she runs a place called the Alterfuck Centre in Janine um and so basically Mona and her family have bought a building and they've turned it into um a, a school and a nursery for children from the refugee camp and this is a huge refugee camp 14,000 people live in this refugee camp you I couldn't comprehend the size of it until, and we only saw this tiny little part as well. Um, now, Mona's sole aim is to give these children a little slice of normality in when they live in a refugee camp under occupation. So it's a, a place where these children can go and they can actually be children. Um, they can play. They've got a little playground on the roof. They can read books. They're teaching them English because they think it's really important to try and help them to advance by giving them a skill. So English is it. But really as well, these children are all very poor and have very little. So she gives them clothes. When they get donations, they buy clothing for them. This is a place where they got a hot meal. And she told us the stories about quite a few of the children. And it would be things like a child was stealing soap from the toilet because they didn't have any soap at home because they were too poor and they couldn't afford to buy it. Or... They don't often get to eat meat um, because it's so expensive. And so I think there was a special treat and they gave them some meat. And some of the children would put it in their pockets to take home to share with their family because they didn't want to be the only people um, getting this special little treat. And so um, and they do things like parties and things like that. And it was just a really nice place. It was quite um, when we first walked in, a lot of the children were really scared of us um, because they called us white faces. And obviously the soldiers have white faces as well. And quite often for these children, the only white people that they would have met would have been soldiers that are busting into their houses in the middle of the night to take away their older brother or their father and the rest of them. So, um, but they did, they did come around and it was a really touching moment. And for me, they're two things that have stayed with me quite a lot and they're very contrasting. And it's two women who are both resisting the occupation, but doing it in very different ways. Um, and like I say, they did stay with me. Um, and I think as a trade unionist as well, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that um, we were really lucky. Not all of our delegation got to do this, but I actually got to go to Ramallah for May Day um, and for me, 
like having spent many May days in London doing the parade, at, like the march through London and demonstrating in Trafalgar Square, it was a really special time. So we went across and it was full of noise and dancing and bands. But ultimately, it was full of people that were members of a trade union. So um, it was organised by the PGFTU, which is kind of like the Palestinian version of the TUC. And um, they were there and they were campaigning for things that a lot of people here campaign for. So it was like, the, you know, finding work. The minimum wage for Palestinians is a quarter of the minimum wage for Israelis. They weren't allowed to strike. Um, so they were campaigning for stuff like that. It was unemployment's really high over there. I think they said at the time we were there, it's about 60%. Um, and discrimination's not recognised in law. So you can discriminate to people. So they were there and it was just like a rally here. Everyone was getting up on the stage and they were making their speeches. And it was really nice to see as well. There were female trade unionists there too and quite prominent female trade unionists. Um, so for me... That was a really big highlight of going to because as a trade unionist, May Day is like our day and I got to spend it in Ramallah um, and it, it was just, it was amazing. Um, and then since I've come back, it's it's really, I've, well, basically before, I didn't even know, so I live in Luton and I didn't even know that we had um, a local branch of the, the PSC. So I've come back, I've got involved in the local branch We've done an event um, where we spoke about our delegation and a couple of the other women did. And they were really pleased because it got to engage with some different people because quite a lot of women came along to listen to, to us speak. Um, and then through ASE, through our trade union, myself and my colleague, Debbie Ray, we've um, reported back for the trade union. We've spoken at our conference about and it's just about raising the issue here because when I told my friends that I was going to Palestine, they were like, you can't go there. You can't go there. And people automatically think about, um, I think, Gaza and war zones. And of course, that is an issue there. But there are also a lot of other Palestinians that are trying to get on with a daily life, but with very limited movement, access to jobs. And, you know, even things like getting water is difficult because it gets cut off by Israelis when they like by the soldiers when they decide to. So I think, for me, you know, I was able to come back and speak to people I know and say, do you know what? No, it's it's really, really good. Um, so, it, and actually I did want to go back this year, but unfortunately COVID has put a stop to that at the moment. So, um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to say a little bit about a couple of the different minute, m women that we met. Like I say, um, there were a whole host of them, but these were two people that really stuck out in my mind. Um, and if anybody gets an opportunity to visit Palestine or to go on a delegation, I would really, really recommend it. Thanks, Lee. That was uh, really powerful. And I always find it really powerful listening to people talk about what they have seen. It's very interesting what you said about um, the children. We visited, visited a school in Hebron, which had just been attacked by soldiers. And when we went in, one of the children started crying and it was because he thought we were Israeli settlers and we were there to harm him. So, you know, it does have that impact. It's very traumatic for children and young people, uh, the whole everyday life experience for them. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Samia al Botme, who's from uh, who's a, a professor from the um, university. Um, uh, Bazaar University, many of you I'm sure will have heard Samia uh, speak before and she uh, she's extremely knowledgeable and we always learn a huge amount from, from, from her. She's also going to talk a little bit about the annexation towards the end of her presentation. We thought that would, is quite a big issue at the moment. It would be useful for people to hear about that. So I'll hand over to you Samia and then um, we'll hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise. Um, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for staying in, actually, not coming out, um, and uh, taking part in this uh, webinar uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak a bit, as Louise uh, noted, uh, on two issues. Uh, the, one, the first one is women's lives under uh, colonization and uh, the manner with which Palestinian women resist but also a bit on the annexation because it's the latest form of oppression yeah. and uh, advancement of colonization that Israel is using to uh, annex further land, but also 
people, affecting people's lives, people's resources, and uh, people's futures, basically. Um, women's lives in, in Palestine are um, highly uh, uh, segregated in, uh, depending on where they live. So you have uh, the lives of women in the Gaza Strip are very different from the West Bank. And it's all defined by uh, uh, colonialism. Uh, the manner with which colonialism manifests itself in the Gaza Strip is very different. It is colonialism, the oppression measures, the violations of people's rights are, are very different though. Uh, people uh, in Gaza have, um, I mean, the UN noted that uh, in, by 2020, and this was two years ago, uh, Gaza uh, is, is going to be labeled as um, uh, an unhabitable area. Uh, so th the li lives of people there are extremely difficult. Uh, getting access to uh, medical care, uh, having resources is impossible. Uh, the wars on Gaza, whereby you, your houses are uh, uh, bombed and demolished, uh, your lives are at stake at every moment. You have no mechanism to defend yourself, yet you have to go on with life. You, you know, women and uh, families have to bring up their children. You have to find work. Um, Gaza suffers from the highest unemployment rate in the world. Um, very much this situation, this compounded colonialism and uh, 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 suffering in the Gaza Strip, the loss of life, the repeated loss of life, the repeated demolition of houses. The houses that were demolished in 2011 and 2014 wars have not been rebuilt. And these, these are refugees that have been displaced in 1948 and 1967. So their lives are about displacement, repeated displacement. And the impact that has on uh, people's lives is devastating. Much of the burden falls on uh, women. And this is why we see, uh, and Gaza is highly conservative, uh, uh, part of Palestine, even by Palestinian standards. We see many women going out on demonstrations, uh, taking part in resistance activities. Uh, women of all ages, not just you know middle-aged women, but young women, elderly women, um, people with disabilities, even women with disabilities, everyone is taking part because for them it's about um, communicating a message of resistance, but also asking for uh, solidarity. And I will speak about that towards the end of my uh, talk. The lives of women in the West Bank under colonialism is different, yet it is under colonialism. Uh, living in area C of the West Bank, uh, which is 60% of the West Bank, is, is miserable, um, to say the least. Um, people's homes are repeatedly demolished and uh, Israel actually asks people, you have two options, you can demolish your own house or Israel comes and demolishes your house and asks you to pay uh, the cost. So many people actually end up demolishing their own houses. Israel uses the excuse that these houses were built without a permit and uh, basically, Palestinians cannot build. And Israel, in a way, uh, um, issues all of these measures to drive the Palestinians out of their communities, out of their villages, out of their towns. Um, you know, they are devised measures. Very much Israel utilizes the South African uh, example of how to bandestinize uh, people, how to... Um, deprive people of resources, deprive people of jobs, in order to drive people away, to lock people into cantons. So all these measures that South Africa actually, uh, not just devised, but also borrowed from earlier colonial uh, uh, examples, Israel utilizes uh, uh, against the Palestinians. 
Palestinian women actually are at the forefront of uh, resistance uh, to these measures. Uh, the vast majority of workers in the agricultural sector are women. Agriculture is at the forefront of uh, resistance. Israel has this, um, it's really very arbitrary uh, rule. If, if land is cultivated, uh, it takes more measures from Israel to confiscate the land. And women, uh, very much of the time, cultivate their land to protect it. Uh, agriculture doesn't pay here in Palestine for many reasons, uh, but many women in particular cultivate their land at a loss to protect it from confiscation. And uh, this is why we find many women workers in the agricultural sector who are very poor, but they persevere, they persist, because for them, not working the land, not cultivating the land, very much means confiscating the land, uh, Israel confiscating uh, uh, the land. Um, the, uh, we have marches in the West Bank, like the march, the return march in Gaza that takes place every Friday. Now it has stopped because of COVID-19. But in the West Bank, we have these marches that take place uh, along the wall um, in many villages in the north of Palestine to uh, the south. Um, and these marches are very much organized by women, um, not just in terms of taking care of uh, uh, the crowds and uh, uh, enabling them to uh, come into the villages and directing them. Women plan these marches, work in planning, in, in strategizing these, uh, these marches. And uh, this is why we get very many women arrested also in, in, in the marches. Um, also, there very many women are uh, active in um, resisting colonialism through um, uh, measures that try to um, bring life, uh, normality to, to people. Lee explained, you know, the issue of offering refugee children uh, a proper meal or uh, taking children to an outing. Um, very much uh, women organizations do that. Uh, for example, women prisoners, taking out women prisoners, ex-prisoners to war with their children. Very many of these women do not know their children. So uh, women, very m women organizations, very much of the time, um, uh, in a way, organize these activities to enable both women prisoners and uh, their children to um, become more acquainted and uh, more normally. Um, there is also the role of women in strategizing um, non-violent or non, non, um, uh, very simple forms of um, uh, resistance, uh, including BDS. Um, uh, there are very many women, actually the vast majority of uh, BDSers here in Palestine strategizing uh, on BDS are women. Um, so they are at the forefront of uh, resistance. Uh, Israel realizes that, and uh, this is why we find the number of Palestinian women prisoners rising. Um, just three months ago, we had one of our students at Birzeit University arrested. Uh, she's a 19-year-old girl, you know, and she's part of the student union. She was arrested for um, uh, voicing her opinion on uh, online, I think, Facebook. Um, now Israel keeps on renewing her arrest uh, every couple of months and... Uh, um, you know, no one knows how long will she be arrested uh, for. Um, at the same time, Israel also uh, uh, uses women to uh, interrogate family members. A colleague of mine, she's, she works in the media studies department. She was used, she's a 60-year-old woman. Um, she's, uh, she's, she's very well known for resisting Israel's. Uh, colonization. Her son was uh, arrested. 
And upon the arrest of her son, she uh, was arrested and she was used to threaten her son uh, uh, if he doesn't uh, admit to whatever they want him to, that she will be harmed. So women are, in a way, are used, and of course, I mean, her son uh, uh, didn't cooperate. She uh, also didn't uh, cooperate with them, trying to use her to put pressure on her son. Eventually, her house was demolished. Uh, they accused her son of uh, threatening the security of the state of Israel, and uh, her house was demolished. She stood uh, um, uh, high in the face of the house uh, demolition. Um, she was, in a way, sending messages to her son in prison that he should just take care of himself. You know, the house can be rebuilt. And, you know, this is a family. It's a very old house. It's a 200-year-old house. So Israel tries, in a way, to undermine communities through undermining women, but women have been at uh, uh, the resistance to Israel's colonialism, has been uh, innovative, has been uh, creative, and is um, evolving, actually, uh, over time. Um, and this is why Israel has been putting a lot of pressure yesterday on women. Yesterday, there was a big march in Jericho. Uh, against the annexation and um, and the, the marchers there, the speakers there, uh, were uh, women um, in a way providing their insights into how to resist. And um, as I said, the resistance is not just about um, engaging in demonstrations, it's about what women do to protect the land, protect their families, protect themselves, and in a way, keep the memory of what is Palestine, uh, our lives as Palestinians, our culture that is being threatened and actually uh, falsified by Israel, including our history, our... So women play a huge role in... Um, maintaining that, in strengthening it, and in keeping Palestinian society steadfast. I will talk a bit about the annexation because, in a way, and I will share, um, I will share the map of annexation that Israel has been, um, has been putting through. And this is the map of the West Bank. This one is the map of the West Bank. On the side, this is the map of Gaza. Um, you can see the light yellow here on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, this is the Jordan Valley. This is the borders with Jordan. All this area is a uh, subject for annexation, which is huge. It's, it's it comes to 33% of the West Bank. You can see also these yellow parts um, all of these uh, are areas subject to annexation. These are basically areas around um, settlements. Settlements are uh, usually uh, are very small in size, but the land annexed around them is, is huge. So this will basically displace or cantonize nearly 75 Palestinian villages and affect nearly 120,000 people. It affects 120,000 people, but affects the lives of the 3 million Palestinians because this is where we cultivate. This is the land. You know, these are, these are the lowlands of Palestine, but they are very flat and they're full of water. So Israel is annexing our gardens, basically. Uh, our uh, water resources, um, and and that's going to deprive the Palestinians of uh, um, uh, much of their uh, livelihoods, and it will make our lives much more difficult geographically, because you can see we're basically surrounded 
totally. We are cantonized all of these little areas, break up Palestinian territories. So this will, it will become really very much the South African example, uh, the townships where people are crowded in small areas and cut off from all uh, uh, capacity to survive. And, um, and that will uh, uh, basically, Israel hopes, it will drive Palestinians out. Uh, when they have no resources, no jobs, um, with raids, with uh, uh, with raids, with uh, 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 oppression, uh, the aim is to uh, drive as many uh, Palestinians out as possible. And of course, for us as Palestinians, uh, we understand that, and because uh, of that, we resist. We resist in many ways. Uh, including demonstrations, including um, uh, activities to create a sense of normality for our children and uh, our everyday lives. But more importantly, we use BDS. And um, BDS, as many of you have been active in BDS, I, I want to stress the importance of BDS against uh, Israel's uh, annexation. It's because it's a tool that brings us Palestinians living under uh, Israel colonialism together with the uh, uh, with uh, people who stand in solidarity with us around the world. And um, I would ask you to please intensify your efforts to put pressure on Israel through economic uh, 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 boycotts, uh, through sanctioning Israel's arms, Israel's trade agreements, uh, through using trade unions to pass motions to isolate uh, uh, Israel around uh, the world, be it in academic institutions, in economic forums, um, also sports and culture. Um, in a way, we understand that our resistance uh, will go on for long. Uh, this is a lesson that history teaches us, um, that basically if you resist and you continue to resist, colonialism will end. And we believe in that as Palestinians. And this is why we uh, persevere. And this is why we devise mechanisms to resist Israel. We need your solidarity uh, in resisting Israel's colonialism because the fight is one. The fight is against racism, is against oppression, is against uh, violations of uh, human rights. Um, we do stand in solidarity as Palestinians with other struggles around the world, and especially these days with uh, uh, Black American American struggle uh, against racism uh, in the U.S. Uh, with the indigenous people's struggle around the world. And we look to your solidarity and your support in our struggle. Thank you. Thanks, Samia. That was uh, an extremely powerful account. As always, an honour to be in your company and hear from you and your extreme knowledge of the situation. So our final speaker is Zita Holborn. She also went on the women's delegation from the TUC. She's PCS vice president, very well known in the trade union movement, a very vocal and uh, a speaker, uh, very knowledgeable. She's also the co-founder and chair of Barrett UK. And I know she's been doing huge amounts of work around the Black Lives Matter movement at the moment, uh, but also is regularly speaking out about the situation in Palestine. So it's a real pleasure to have you with us, Zita, and thank you for giving up. I know how busy you are. Um, so I'm going to hand over over to Zita, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everybody, um, and uh, you know, thank you for inviting me to speak at this event. As has been um, mentioned, I was part of the um, All Women's Delegation to Palestine, but I have been supporting the PSC and the people of Palestine for many years. Um, in addition to my activist roles, um, I'm involved in the creative sector, the cultural sector, and I'm a visual artist and performance poet. So I've been working with Palestinian poets and doing fundraisers for the PSC and creating art and putting on exhibitions to draw attention and bring attention to the struggles of um, Palestinian people and to bring uh, solidarity. 
Um, the delegation that we took to Palestine last year was um, histor historical and important. Um, and I would say that it's historical because it was an all women's delegation and it was the first of a kind um, uh, trade union all women's delegation going to Palestine. But it was important because um, the strength of connecting women with women, I think, meant that the messages we brought back to the UK and the work we did back in the UK really um, connected with um, women here. Um, because they could relate, even if they've not never been through anything as horrendous as women in Palestine are going through, they could relate to that struggle um, as women. And we met women that were incredibly, incredibly strong everywhere we went. We witnessed the strength of women in Palestine firsthand. We saw it in um, the Women's Coalition of Peace. We saw it in the women and girls of Nabi Saleh. We saw it in the women's center and nursery in Jenin. We saw it in the mothers fighting to protect their children, but also their existence and their land and their futures at the same time as knowing that tomorrow is not guaranteed. Um, as women globally, uh, we are protectors of families. We're the people that hold families together, but also hold communities together. Um, and we um, work to ensure that those communities and our networks and our families are connected together, are safe. We, we're the ones that create safe spaces for our communities and lead uh, on doing that. Um, and I think there's no stronger force uh, than a mother protecting her child. You will fight tooth and nail to protect your child but also to protect your child's uh, future. So I would say that the, the women of Palestine are freedom fighters because actually just carrying on and trying to get on with day-to-day -day life and trying to make things as normal and regularized for your family, for your children, for your community is in itself an act of resistance. And so the women we met, these are women who have been through untold pain and untold struggles um, and have had to live, you know, young women who have had to spend their whole life in that struggle. They've never known anything different, or not just young women, you know, women of all ages who've never known anything different. And even though they're bearing um, the, the scars of what they've been through, um, they are really determined um, and they are the people that are taking us forward. And they actually, they gave us strength. So, you know, we go through struggles and battles in the UK. We face uh, gender discrimination as a black woman. I face racism and gender discrimination, but we actually gained a lot of strength by being with those women and seeing what they go through and how they fight and how they stand up for their rights and how they get up every day and keep going in those circumstances. So back in the UK, having had that um, first-hand experience of meeting with women and not just women, obviously we met with men and women, but our focus was on women's groups and, and women uh, uh, in Palestine. Um, you know, I came back and I tried to share that experience, that first-hand experience of what I'd seen and heard um, with as many people as possible. So in the trade union movement, in community activism, um, doing presentations, at our trade union conferences, our women's seminar, I regularly um, update, I chair the PCS National Women's uh, Committee and I regularly update our committee on what's happening in Palestine and what we can do and how we can support and how we can give solidarity. Um, you know, rather than it just all being channeled through our international committee and the work that our international committee does, which I also chair, which is obviously also very important. Um, but bringing in the experience from a different perspective, uh, I think, was important. I'm also um, the Joint National Chair of the Artists' Union England. And last year at TUC Congress, our union um, 
uh, put forward a motion to the Congress, a solidarity motion with Palestine. And even though I wasn't the person that moved it, um, I did speak and second it from the PCS union. I received um, death threats and abuse and hate mail for having for our union um, having put that motion up. And some of the um, uh, abusive messages that came through were asking, well, you're artists, you represent artists. What has Palestine got to do with you? Well, actually, we're trade unionists. It doesn't matter, you know, who we represent and what kind of workers we represent. Our, our delegation to Palestine was very, very diverse, representing all sorts of workers across the board. But more important still, we're human beings. So we care about human rights and humanity and equality and justice. So the idea that because we were an artist union, it wasn't relevant to us is just uh, nonsensical. But I think it's no, um, you, you know, it's no coincidence that even though I was, it was a man that moved the motion, the person who was targeted for the most abuse was me as a woman and as a black woman. And when we were in Palestine, um, the delegation was nearly all white, but there were two of us who were black women on that delegation. From the time we stepped off the plane, we experienced firsthand the difference in treatment um, in Israel when we stepped off the plane, plane because it was us that were scrutinized and questioned when nobody else was. But we also had encounters and experiences um, while we were there. Um, so one of the things that I've been asked to speak, speak about, and actually Samia has touched on it, in, in fact, in her contribution, is about the connection between Black Lives Matter and the struggle for, for peace, equality and justice in Palestine. And I want to share with you, if it will show on the screen, if I hold it up to my computer, this is a poster that I created years ago, way before I went to Palestine. Let's see if you can see it. Can you see that? Yeah? It's a, it's a Palestinian woman and an African woman, and they're holding a sign together and, which says unity is strength. So I've been creating art and making those connections for a long time, you know, um, because I recognize as a black woman who has had to fight racism throughout my entire life, that our struggles are connected. Um, you know, the, the struggle against racism and against oppression, and that's what I see the Palestinian people as facing, racism, um, is an, a global struggle. Um, and Samia mentioned about the connection with um, African-American people and indigenous people, but also black people in the UK are facing horrific racism. And I, for many years, have supported family justice campaigns, both in the UK and the USA, people who have um, experienced deaths at the hands of the state and their families are now fighting for justice for years and decades. Virtually all of those campaigns are led by women from that family or women who have decided to support those families in taking the campaign forward. It's the aunties and the mothers and the sisters that lead those campaigns and have to put their own life on hold to fight for justice. And so, um, yes, there is a co uh, correlation, there is a connection between what Black Lives Matter is saying and what the people of Palestine are saying, because what they're facing is structural, systemic, um, oppression and as Samia has mentioned with a legacy not even just a legacy of colonialism um, and in the same way black people are facing the legacy of enslavement as well as colonialism but it's current it's happening now and that's the argument that's been made by the Black Lives Matter movement and black activists who have been fighting for race equality for years that it's systemic discrimination and racism that we're facing that because Britain, Britain, America is still holding on to those colonial ties and those systems that look at two sets of people and believe that one set of people is less worthy and has less rights than the other. And so when um, we say Black Lives Matter, when we say Free Palestine, this isn't just a hashtag, it's not a, just a slogan, it's a rallying call for justice, for equality, for freedom, for peace, for rights, for racism, for discrimination, and for oppression to end. So our struggles are connected, will always be connected, and we're stronger together when we fight back together. So that's mm -hmm. crucial that we do so. Thank you.
Oh, thanks, Zita. That was a really powerful speech. I remember the motion. And actually, I remember the abuse that you received at TUC. Um, and you stood up to it really well as you continue to stand up and fight for equality and justice for all people. So thank you for all that you continue to do. I know Zita is really busy and I think she will have to leave us. So I'm really sorry that she can't stop for uh, too much longer. But uh, thank you for your a really inspirational talk. And I certainly know from my union and many other unions will know that the situation you talk about when people arrive in Israel mm -hmm. is exactly the same. People are, uh, you know, there's real discrimination against black people there and we see it with our members and you experienced it on the delegation. So as I say, uh, we absolutely support you and thank you for what you're, um, you're continuing to do. Uh, at the moment, I've got three questions. So I'm gonna read out our three questions um, and then any of our speakers, uh, I'm happy for you to respond. And, and Zita, if you have to leave us, that's fine. And thank you very much. So uh, the first question uh, is from Pia. She says, can you say something re about the differences in lives in how they organize comparing women in the West Bank and women in Gaza? So is there a difference? Is it, uh, uh, maybe Samia, you would be best to answer that. So their experiences of women in Gaza and the West Bank and their, how they organize. Um, I mean, the conditions they live under, the, um, the, the form of colonialism they live under is different. Um, Palestinian, uh, Palestinians in general, including women, are locked in Gaza. So you cannot travel, uh, uh, you cannot export, import freely. This has implications for people's lives in the sense that you cannot get an education, you cannot work. And uh, the fact that uh, women uh, basically um, are uh, taking care of their uh, families, they're at the forefront of having to cater for uh, their families. Uh, if you have a, a child with disability, if you have an elderly person that needs uh, care, uh, the burden on women is uh, double and triple because she doesn't have any support uh, because of uh, the siege on, uh, on Gaza. Uh, women do take part in, in the marches, um, but cannot, for example, cultivate the land because every time Gazans try to cultivate whatever land is left for them, Israel's bombs uh, uh, the farmers. So their form of resistance is uh, managing, managing under extremely harsh conditions, managing for their for themselves, for their children, for their uh, for the incapacity to get work because of uh, the siege. Um, but they still uh, persevere. They still are very creative, actually. Very many women um, students at universities are involved in inventions, are involved in uh, experimenting uh, to create technology that they cannot import from the rest of the world. So women are being very innovative in their everyday life. They are also, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, women are uh, uh, the part of the family that the entire family basically depends on. And again, the fact that um, many Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, over 20,000 homes were destroyed in just one war. And uh, this basically means that women have to create a sense of normality on the catastrophic conditions and that's very heroic uh, to just ma maintain normality under these extreme conditions in the west bank it's different it's yet another form of colonialism and uh, women's resistance to colonialism is is different uh, women do cultivate the land as i said women do engage in uh, resistance activities, be it BDS, be it uh, marches, uh, be it uh, trying to support uh, families of prisoners, uh, families of uh, martyrs, um, uh, also uh, presenting a Palestinian case 
locally and internationally um, most of the time it's actually women who are speaking on uh, Palestinian uh, issues they are at the forefront of uh, the resistance movement uh, they are at the forefront of uh, strategizing uh, uh, for the movement um, different forms again uh, no matter where uh, where they are so Palestinian women are in a way um, coping but they are also being innovative about creating a sense of normality they are resisting they are articulating their resistance not just in terms of connecting locally and internationally but connecting to other struggles around the world learning from his, the history of colonialism of uh, um, indigenous people struggles of the south african uh, struggle um so um the reality of women is, is harsh and difficult, yet our resistance is, um, is coping and trying to, um, in a way, come up with strategies that would uh, not just highlight our case, but bring uh, a form of pressure to end Israel's colonialism. Thanks, Samia. Um, just another couple of questions. Something somebody's just asked about involvement of young women, the next generation, wh whether there is big involvement of young women at the moment. And also, could you just talk briefly about the checkpoints and the restric restrictions on freedom of movement? Yes, the young women actually are very much involved in resistance. I mean, I can see it on campus. They go out uh, on the marches. Uh, they are part of... Uh, planning uh, the marches and uh, and this is why Palestinian women young women are getting more and more uh, arrested by Israel um, and um, that's something actually uh, that women are seeing themselves not just um, they're not playing the traditional patriarchal role uh, they are uh, at the forefront of uh, uh, resistance uh, Palestinian women are also putting the Palestinian case legally, internationally. So you have many Palestinian uh, young uh, women lawyers who are taking um, Israel to, uh, uh, to court internationally. So they are playing a, a very, um, in a way, evolving role. They've always been. If you look at pictures of the first intifada, the second intifada, um, again, now uh, they are uh, playing the same role and just taking things a bit uh, further in terms of uh, strategizing. Um, checkpoints and um, movement. Actually, um, in a way, it's been a way of life for us actually to live uh, in, in these uh, small cantons where we cannot move uh, freely. And the women have been devastated by uh, movement restrictions much more than men. Men are restricted in the sense that they are stopped more frequently at checkpoints. And uh, they are questioned and they are arrested. Uh, men are more uh, uh, sort of uh, exposed to being arrested at checkpoints. But but these movement restrictions actually affect women more profoundly because movement restrictions mean that women cannot travel uh, between areas easily. They cannot because your journey between point A and point B is unknown. Uh, for example, you know, the distance between Ramallah and uh, Bethlehem is, say, one and a half hours. You might get there in three, you might get there in seven hours, you might get there in one and a half hours. You don't know, depending on the checkpoints, depending. I mean, this afternoon we've heard somebody who's, self, who's out in a group um, uh, taking their sister to, she's getting married, I don't know, I think in, in Ramallah, coming from Bethlehem, he was shot at the checkpoint. So the wedding turned into a, fu a funeral in two minutes. Um, so you really don't know what's going to happen. Now, for women, they cannot actually take the risk of moving because uh, they don't know when they're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And being in a patriarchal society, colonialism works to oppress women even further 
So we, women have to either lose their jobs in a different city or they have to lose their education. So although these movement restrictions, uh, uh, which come in the form of checkpoints, of roadblocks, of locking down uh, entire areas, now with annexation, we are told that all these annexed areas are going to have even more uh, checkpoints and more uh, roadblocks and we will have to, you cannot enter these areas unless you prove that you live there. This means that we will be living in these areas as, as we're living in prisons. No one can come and visit us unless Israel uh, authorizes it. So all of this reality puts the lives of women even, makes the lives of women uh, much, much harsher and much more uh, difficult. Thanks, Samia. I mean, Lee, I'm just going to come to you because you have been there uh, and you have experienced the checkpoint system, uh, as many of us that have traveled there have. You know, I just wonder whether you want to reflect on that, just having seen it from outside, um, because obviously Palestinians live it with live with it on their daily lives but you've been and you've seen yeah I mean uh first of all I have to say the whole time we were there we were quite lucky we were never stopped at a checkpoint and physically pulled over and had soldiers come on board so we did manage to go through without um much harassment I think the first time you see a checkpoint um it, it's quite you it's quite a daunting prospect um i think the thing that sticks with me most of all is the length of time that it takes you to get anywhere so here you might be able to say oh, i'm just popping wherever in in palestine you don't just pop anywhere you can't because it takes you so long to physically get through checkpoints um the other thing you notice when you're coming from kind of the uh, uh, side of uh, Palestine across through a checkpoint the amount of cars that are just left on the side of the street where people leave their cars because it's quicker to try and walk through but the traffic jams are huge I think the longest one we had to get through took us um maybe about an hour and a half nearly two hours and that was at night so you can't really plan journeys because you don't know if it's going to take you half an hour or six hours to get through because you just don't know what's happening um, it's not very nice seeing there are soldiers everywhere with huge guns, um, a lot of them very young, looking quite bored, not really wanting to be there. Um, and you go through and then obviously we, we're going through and you're seeing lots of Palestinian people just being pulled over and harassed, essentially, just for being Palestinian. Um, so it's, it's quite a daunting prospect and it really makes you appreciate the freedom of movement that we have in this country and the freedom of movement that is removed from Palestinians just for being Palestinian. Thanks, Lee. That's uh, very important to note. And people have been commenting in the chat as well, because I think people recognise that. There's just been a question on Facebook, Samia, about the treatment of female prisoners. And I know in other webinars I've done, people have asked, because I think people sort of expected that prisoners would be released during this uh, COVID epidemic and stuff, but I don't think that that has happened. In fact, I think there has been a slight increase in prisoners, actually, particularly child prisoners. So, but it would be useful to know about women prisoners. Yeah, indeed, actually. Israel has increased its raids of Palestinian areas and homes, and uh, there has been a huge rise lately. I mean, since March, um, with uh, uh, coming into homes, one a.m., 2 a.m., raiding homes, scaring children, arresting both men and women. So there has been a rise in uh, in the number of arrests, night arrests. They're uh, uh, always taking place in the early morning. Uh, but there is also a sudden rise in raids of uh, cities. A few days ago, we just had the Israelis coming into Ramallah, shooting and you know scaring people for no reason and pulling out um so in a way israel's measures are becoming extremely vicious and extremely um uh, in a way there was there wasn't there is no reason but to come in to an area and scare people um it's really extremely difficult to explain the situation to children in particular uh, we usually get children to sleep um, these days under, uh, right under the window because if there is shooting, uh, they won't get hit. And um, 
you know, they ask us, you know, why are we doing this? Why are they shooting at us? Well, you know, it's, uh, everyone is sleeping at night. Why do we have, I mean, the, the moment um, they start shooting uh, uh, tear gas bombs, we have to rush and close all the windows. And it's, you know, it's a very hot summer here. Uh, so the first moment we hear uh, shooting, everyone has to rush to the windows to shut the, uh, the windows from the tear gas. Um, when the tear gas affects the children, uh, they're really scared and they don't know why can't they breathe normally. Why? So all of this is extremely difficult. And then when you come to a checkpoint and they see the soldier who actually shot at their house in the evening, they see him or her as a person and, you know, having to, to understand, but this is a human being. So they expect a monster, but they see a human being and they cannot really comprehend why this human being is shooting at me at night while, uh, while I'm sleeping. So the, the arrest of, and the manner with which the soldiers come to arrest people is they scare in purposefully the entire neighborhood. So they come into a neighborhood, they wake everyone up, they shoot, they bomb, they uh, actually explode the gates, they don't open the gate. So it's a whole theatrical uh, uh, act that is meant to scare and intimidate and uh, oppress uh, people. There has been a rise in Israel's arrests. Um, and uh, I think that's to preempt any resistance to the annexation. Um, because, of course, Israel knows that we will, uh, uh, we will protest and uh, we will resist the annexation. So, in a way, there has been a huge rise. Uh, the use of family members to put pressure on prisoners, say, using the mother of a prisoner or using the father of a woman uh, prisoner to put uh, pressure on them has been a mechanism that Israel uses uh, a lot. Um, also, the arrest of children has been uh, on the rise. And uh, these children are then put under house arrest and they are prevented from uh, seeking education, especially in Jerusalem. So they are arrested for a period of time, months. Then they are put under house arrest again for years or months. During the, these times, they are not allowed to access schools. So you have, you know, they're ruining people's lives systematically, and boys and girls. Um, especially girls. Girls have been targeted. Uh, when you cross over from Jordan, you find Israel stopping more girls than boys on the side, interrogating them, because Israel claims that young women have been carrying out more stabbings compared to men. You know, there are 14, 15-year-old uh, children, boys and girls, but the women in uh, lately have been uh, more targeted uh, than men and girls more targeted than boys. This has be has become sort of a more visible phenomenon. Thanks, Samia. That's really helpful. So I'm going to just sum up now. I want to thank all of our speakers. They have been extremely, extremely powerful. So, uh, good night, everyone. Thanks, Samia. Thanks, Lee. And thanks thank to you. all the team, because there's a very big team of PSE staff who've been helping. So thank you, everyone. And stay safe, Samia. And I'll see thank you Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events, and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.